Okay, so first I'll, I'll, I'll preface this for a moment. Um, go, go, to, go to Google Images. Images.google.com. Okay. Put Starlink train in the search. First thing you're going to see is that. Notice like the middle one there. Uh, uh, you can you can take a look at the you can take a look at any one of them. Um, they 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 occur at various times. There's one. Um, this has been in the news a bit lately. Uh, you may have seen. I, I I think there was some coverage on a couple of maybe WBZ or did you see it? Haven't seen it. I I was home three days ago. Got out of my car and said, "Oh, that's an interesting meteor." Wait a minute, meteors don't move in a block. And, yeah, and so, yeah, so this is, this is an example of what one would look like. It happens at sunset because you're getting the sun reflected from where it hasn't gotten as dark yet. The device is about the size of, um, no, it's not even that big, it's about that big. Um, they are launched, they are launched in, a, like, a, they, they have a rotating stack of coasters. They launch usually about 48 of these in a time. They have a, a dispenser with four sides. Each side has 16 satellites, and they just do this, and then the thing rotates, and they do it again. And so this is what one looks like. Um, I will refrain from commenting on the challenging aspects of this for the night sky. Um, and so what I'm going to do now... <laughs> so, um, so in a, the reason, the other thing I want to point out here is if I go to another website, there are people who um, it's called satelliteweb.space. Okay, whenever this happens here. Oh, come on. Maybe I've. There you go. This is a live map of all the satellites. Of all of this is only Starlink. There are 3,823 of these operating. You see the ones in the line. Those are the trains that you saw in the picture. But the, most of the rest of them is designed that everybody below a certain latitude has coverage, right? Yes, and the ones that go over the pole are prototypes for actually getting coverage at both poles. I have a colleague who sent me a Twitter, a Twitter message from McMurdo Station in, in the Antarctic using this system. My point is, there are 3,823 of these. Elon Musk has permission to build 12,000 of them, and the extended phase will be 42,000. How do they keep them all from collide? Space is an empty place. Believe it or not, there aren't that many collisions yet. But are they all at the same altitude? They are at a little bit of a range of altitudes. So typically, they park them at a reasonably low altitude. It used to be 210 kilometers altitude, which is pretty deep in the atmosphere. And then they would raise them to about 600 kilometers. So all of those are about 600 kilometers. I don't like the term park because these are orbiting at high uh, no, they are not. They're, 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 there's a lower Earth orbit, so those precess, and so that's why this is live. If you, no, these are all geosynchronous. They're about 600 kilometers altitude. Do you know as he released what the capacity is of each satellite? Oh, I don't know the, I don't know the, I don't know the bandwidth of each one. Um, but there's a. Now I will. So I, my point is to make you aware that these are up there, and. Um, they're becoming quite popular. Has anybody actually tried the service? No. Yeah. I, I, again, space is a very empty place. These are small things. So on a map this, like this, it looks dense. Um, you're not, it's going to be very low probability you're going to hit one. Thank you. If these were bottles on the ocean, you would have a great deal of difficulty finding Sure. Um, and, and space, given the radius, do you 
that much further out, it's even less. Having said that, uh, things at the things in the same orbit orbital height, but and if I uh, orbits, they're going to find each other sooner or later. So if I I put in, you can basically, I'll ju I'll just show you something. It. Why do I know our, the coordinates of Haystack Observatory? <laughs> um, you guys over there at Haystack, there was a station. So there you go. Um, the thing in the center is about five miles from us. Are you going to be Um, the the sensors at Hay the the Lincoln Laboratory part of the sensors at Haystack are part of the the uh, orbit tracking network. So um, some of this data comes from that. Um, some of the data comes from Starlink itself, which per each one of these has GPS on it, so it would actually it actually does also figure out where it is. Um, but the reason I point this out to all of you is that. So here's a good example of, oh, um, let me go to the world map. Let me see here. Eh, come on. I was just asking about bandwidth. I was doing some reading. Uh, the download speed is only like a maximum of 100 megabits per second. Oh, it's more than that. Okay. So th what I've clicked on now, I've replaced all the Starlink satellites with the GPS cluster which somebody in this room might know something about. Um, and that is not in geosynchronous orbit, but it is not in low Earth orbit either. It is a very slowly processing orbit from any part in the ground, right? 20-ish, a little more, let's, let's call it more than 20,000, less than 36,600. Um, you see that, but the density you'll notice is quite different. The other thing, it's, it's fun to play with this particular thing. The other thing you can click on is OneWeb. Now you notice that those are not nearly as many and they're in definite orbital planes, right? They're lined up along lines of constant, um, basically local time. Um, that's because OneWeb has had financial difficulties. At one point, OneWeb was not owned by anybody for a little bit. Nobody was sure who's gonna take possession of those, but you can just compare what different companies do. So yeah, low Earth orbit is getting very crowded. Um, so that's just your, when you hear people talking about Starlink, well, that's what's going on. So that was just public service announcement. Um, that's, was, oh, this right here? Uh, they, they're, they're in the same orbital plane at the same altitude. They're following each other. Um, again, Space is a reasonably empty place. What is the function of the train again? The train, um, sometimes they put them in a train before they disperse them like this to provide a certain area. As I was mentioning, um, they typically put them at a lower, they used to put them at quite low altitude, 200 or so kilometers, check them out. And if they all checked out okay, they would raise the orbital altitude to 600-ish kilometers, which is what you see here. The advantage of that is if something's wrong with the satellite and it doesn't respond, it just burns up. Um, except if you have a moderate geomagnetic storm and you lose 48 of them, which is what happened. So now actually they park them much higher. They park them about 300 and something kilometers orbit so that their chances of that are reduced. But if you have 3,800 of them up and you lose 48, so, how much do you know about the actual I believe they might be mesh network. I don't remember. So in other words, the, the, the packets may be handed off until they find a, a ground station. So that's what that's what allows people to Think of it like a cellular network. Cells are moving. 
The iridium, also, the, the iridium cluster does that. I, yeah. I can tell you for a fact that, that mesh networks are great as far as reliability goes. They're really not that great as far as bandwidth goes. Yeah. And, and the knock always on, on Leo low Earth orbit telecom system is that it has to be very limited. So, by the way, I've changed the orb. I've changed to have more of a polar view. You can see that they obviously concentrate the constellations where people live, right? But you do see that there are some that are transpolar. That's those lines that go like that. So they they are sort of realizing that there are there are some communications that are necessary. Um, the last thing I want to mention about this before I move to a, a the last short thing I was going to talk about is that. They have filed with the FCC to essentially, they would like to enable direct from your phone to these. They would like to compete with cellular towers on the ground. For a phone call and data. So, so they are actually going to allow you to stream video? Is that There's a very active discussion at the FCC about whether this is how one licenses this, even if you can do it technically, right? Because there are different license classes and... I, 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 can tell you, so from a bandwidth point of view... I know. Okay. I sold microwave radio for years, and I know that I could get the bandwidth that I wanted to get for 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 the the that streaming video, it's like 80%. You can also or more. Right. So this is, an, this is a very active area. People are really competing with a bunch, for a bunch of things. Something like that. I mean, you're going over a few hundred kilometers either way. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of tools. This is one of them where you can, uh, somebody, I, there's a phone app. You can plug in where you are and it will give you a little ping. Sure. Oh, they're, they're, once you know how to look for them, I mean, when you get a stream like that one right there, right, it's pretty unmistakable. It's so, it's a different world. So what's the, the website? It's called Satellite Map. Dot space. There's apparently a dot space domain, which I didn't know until I uh, did that. Anyhow, just something to be aware of. So at that website, satellite map dot space, you can go and look for various networks or various. I think right now they have the Starlink, the OneWeb, and the GPS cluster. I'm not sure what else they have. And by the way, Chip, they do not have Beidou, they do not have Galileo, they do not have the other constellations yet. Um, they're working on it. Can I eject this? Yeah, oh, actually, I can. I can just use this right here. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yes. Yes. The, okay. So let let me explain one thing about how this goes. Is that before the last five to ten years. The only people that launched into space were mostly national governments, right? And so it was easy to regulate that because these are all people who are used to going through licensing processes and what have you. As commercial space got more inexpensive and platforms like this started becoming more and more tractable, um, all of the, all of the, for example, the frequency licensing for this stuff because it's government goes to the NTIA. That's the, the or is not the FCC. The NTIA regulates everything that is like if you have a government radar, that's how you license. All of these commercial people, though, have to get licensed to the FCC because the FCC regulates commerce. And the FCC realized that 
it was a bit of a wild west in that, you know, they should maybe be a little bit careful about which licenses they gave out. So they've started to pay close attention to this. They've also started to try to regulate orbital debris themselves because what they realize is that the only people tracking this for non-federal users were the people who licensed the telemetry to and from the satellites, which is the FCC. So the FCC itself has gotten into the game of telling you how, what, where you have to put propulsion on your satellite, how long it can be up there before it deorbits. They're worried about the debris problem. It's, it, is, it, is, it is getting worse. And if you, if you really enjoy double entry bookkeeping, I'm sure you all do, um, just, and, and Skip has talked about, and I, I'm going to reference something that Skip has said before about the amateur radio bands being the, un, the, you know, the, the only place almost in the entire radio licensing system where you don't have to license a frequency on a piece of equipment with a modulation pattern. You can go anywhere in that. Imagine that you're licensing a satellite and it's in low Earth orbit, so it's passing over a hundred and something countries. Technically, each of those countries owns the airspace above that country. So theoretically, you should be licensing yourself for all of those countries. What usually happens is most of them don't have enough money to have licensing where they can enforce this, so people ignore it. But that's becoming increasingly not a great practice because we've got more and more stuff up there and more and more countries are beginning to pay attention to this. So it's, watch this space. And uh, when you license something, the, the, the FCC, in addition to the Amateur Radio Part 97 service, all the other parts, the FCC goes through the United States government f to coordinate frequency bands. You know, this frequency band is primary radar. This frequency band is reserved for radio astronomy. That goes to the International Telecommunications Union, which is in um, Europe. And when the U.S. commits to that band, it is at the level of a diplomatic treaty. So you are, signed, you are committing your country through a formal diplomatic process with actual diplomats in the room. This is why licensing takes so long to change because it is this, it's like going to the United Nations and trying to get a resolution passed. It takes a very long time. So what you're seeing is a unique combination of licensing taking a long time to adapt and innovation going so fast that it's breaking most of the rules that are in place. And it's, it's a very, very interesting transition time. And there are a lot of things that are just starting to not to work anymore because the default stuff of not in my backyard doesn't work anymore. So this is just, it's just, when you tell people that it's a treaty, they suddenly say, oh. So watch the space. It's a treaty organization. Yep. Sure. If Skip and I wish to argue for a new new licensing ban. You know, Skip, you get together with me and you say, hey, you know, at X band, we think this communication service is, was happening. We don't have any standing at the ITU. We have to go to the U.S. delegation, get them to propose it at the World Radio Conference, which occurs every four years. When they have the, when they have the conference, say, in 2022, they work on the agenda for 2026 and they add agenda items for 2030. You get on the 2030 one, and then it survives to 2026, four years later. So it's, it's an eight to 12 year process to get something on the docket. Now imagine how well that works with somebody launching 12,000 satellites in a low Earth orbit when they want to double that stuff in 10 years. It, it doesn't. So it's, it's a really fascinating social, you, you name it. There's, there's an interesting, even just human interaction part of this. It's pretty interesting.